So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and so thankful for your goodness and your kindness to us. You are the great I am. You are the creator and sustainer of all life. And Father, as we are reminded this morning of the greatest gift ever given to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the eternal life that we receive through faith and trust in him. And Father, we are grateful for your great love wherewith you have loved us. We are thankful that we can come this morning and worship together. Uh, over your word, Lord, we ask for your guidance and direction as Brother Jim brings the message this morning. Help us, Lord, to set aside all the cares and thoughts of this day, that we would be able to concentrate on the true meaning of Christmas, Lord, and uh, celebrating the birth of your Son, who is our Savior. And Father, I want to remind us, Lord, and remember those who are unable to be out this morning, who are not feeling well and are going through struggles and through health issues. We ask God that you, by your spirit, would comfort them and encourage them and bless them. And I pray, Lord, as they hear your word, that they would be encouraged this morning. And Father, help us as we hear your word this morning to have our ears open and our hearts tuned to you. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. We are going to be in uh, John chapter 1, and we are going to be looking at verses 1 through 16. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of this fullness, we have all received grace for grace. Perhaps as Harry is reading through this passage, you're saying, well, is this really the Christmas story? I'm not seeing a manger. I'm not seeing a little baby. I'm not, there's no shepherds in the story. There's no wise men in this passage. Um, is this really the Christmas story? John is writing, he is the fourth uh, gospel, and very likely he is writing this after the other three gospels have already written Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I can imagine that John, as he is uh, pulling out the scroll of Matthew and reading through it, he reads through the scroll of Matthew and he sees that Matthew is just beautifully depicting Jesus as the king Maybe he grabs another scroll and he pulls out the scroll and it's the scroll of Luke and he, he looks through that, that, that uh, Luke and he sees, yeah, lots of detail there and yes, he certainly is, uh, he is clearly fully human um, and he reads through Mark and he sees depict, Christ depicted as a servant. But John, John really wants to get at the very essence of 
the incarnation, of the Christmas story, of why Jesus came, of what it really meant. He wants to, to get at the very essence of it. There's a sense in which I can imagine that, after, that John is writing and he's saying he wants to get back to the idea of a relationship. Of course, you know that John, John uh, was one of, if not the closest, of Jesus' disciples very close relationship with him, speaks much of abiding in Christ and fellowship with God. And we're going to see in this passage that, that John is going to teach us how to receive the light that we have been talking about so far. Now, what we're going to see in this passage is not immediately going to be practical, you read, you start reading through this, and you, it's a little bit hard to sort of grasp. What, is it, what does it mean practically? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was... What, what does all of this mean? And sometimes when we come across truth or even preaching that is not immediately practical, we sort of choke on it. This, some of this that we're going to delve in today is it's like steak, or it's, it's, it's stuff we're really going to chew on, to really see the real value of it. This past, um, this past uh, week, I went down with my family and uh, friends as well down to uh, the Iron Rooster down in, down in Annapolis, and we got all kinds of food. And when we were looking at our menus down there, we were looking at what to pick and what to, what to eat, and I was thinking about uh, shrimp, grits and, shrimp and grits. It was, it was good. Um, but anyway, I asked the, I asked the waitress, I said, I said, now this shrimp and grits, will this help me run better? Will, will it help me run? Like I run five miles, I try to run five miles several times a week. Would, will this help me run better? And she looked at me. I, I didn't actually ask that. Uh, you wouldn't ask something like that. You're looking at a, at a menu and you don't say, well, how is this? I, I need something practical. I need something that's going to help me to be able to, you know, uh, do the laundry tomorrow. Would you, would you give me something here that would help me do the laundry tomorrow? It, like, you know, maybe the, maybe the chicken and waffles will help me do laundry tomorrow. You, you wouldn't do that, right? What are you there? You're there to sit down and enjoy the meal because it's enjoyable. And if you don't like chicken and waffles and you don't like shrimp and grits, there are other things on the menu. You can enjoy them. Listen to what Psalm 111 says, verse 2. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. The works of the Lord are great, and they are studied by, the, by all who have pleasure in them. Tonight, we're going to be coming from this passage as well, and you're going to see milk, but today, this morning... We're going to dig into the passage, and we're going to see some meat in the passage that we're going to have to chew on, but I will tell you, I can promise you that there is a very, there's some really important practical truth, particularly at the end of this message as we get into it. What John is driving at in this passage is he wants people to understand the need to receive the light. You need to receive it. Matthew spoke of Jesus being the light, and so did Luke. Jesus is the light of the world. But how personally do you receive that light? And what is it? John's going to answer these questions. and We're, we're going to look at three things this morning. First, we're going to look at the nature of the very source of light. What is the source of this light? Chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. The paradox of receiving the light, chapter 1, verses 5 through 13, and the key, the key, finally, what is the key that unlocks the door to receiving this light, 14 through 16, chapter 1? Let's look first, the nature of the source of the light. And we pick up John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John starts off his writings, his gospel here, with in the beginning. 
he was very likely writing to a group of Jewish people that were it was a diaspora, scattered Jewish people in a large area of uh, in, in in Israel and actually around the Mediterranean Sea and all that. And he was right. And if a Jewish reader was to read this, they very likely would have immediately thought of Genesis one, in the beginning, and in the text it's in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. This text, John is referring, essentially referring, or at least alluding to Genesis chapter 1, and he says, in the beginning was the Word. And then he says, the Word is with God. Now this would have been new news to a Jewish person. There was somebody with God in the beginning when the world was created. There was somebody with God. There was The word was with God. I mean, God spoke creation into existence, but with God, who was with God? I mean, God is the transcendent, non-created one. Who was with God when God created everything? And John explains, and the word was God. He was with God in creation, and he was God and is God. And he is actually the creator of everything. He is the creator of life, and without, without him, nothing was made that was made. He is the source and the originator of life, this word. Now down in verse 14, we clearly see the word became flesh. This is Jesus it's speaking of. In this passage, he is God. He is not part of God. He is not. Um, uh, he is not like a different, different aspect of God. He is God. There are three persons to the Godhead, and only one God. And Jesus is God, and He was with the Father at creation, active in creation. He is the Creator. Now, John also says in this passage, he says the word. Why would he say the word? He doesn't say here the deed or the behavior. He doesn't say in the beginning was the deed or the behavior. He doesn't say in the beginning was the feeling or the experience. He doesn't say in the beginning. He he says in the beginning was the word. The word, God God views the word That is how he created the world. The world was created through, God said, let there be light, for example. He said it. He spoke the world into existence. See, there's something very concrete, very clear about particularly the written word. And Jesus came and he came to be the communication of God to people. It says it this way in Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at various times in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoke to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Through him also he made the world. He has spoken through his Son in these last days, through Christ. Christ, when he came to earth, he is God incarnate. And what he said was the word of God. He mentions that the law and the prophets are the word of God. When he came to earth, he he explains that that is the word of God. And he even says later on that the, the disciples would be used to pen down the word of God. He is the word. He is the communication. He is he is the one. And he is the one. Jesus is the one who spoke the world into existence. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1 says it this way, verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him all, this is important, and we're going to get back to this in a minute, all, all of the fullness should dwell. All of the fullness of God should dwell in Christ. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now maybe at this point you're saying, really? A baby in a manger is all of the fullness of God. 
how does this work? How does this reconcile? We're going to see this in a few moments. But now John is going to, going to say this. This is extremely helpful. Last Sunday morning, we talked about the light. And now we're going to see that John says in this passage that, verse 4, in him, that's Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light is the life. Okay, what does he mean by that? Now, let's just think about it in a minute. Let's go back to Genesis, this time, chapter 2. What does it say in Genesis chapter 2 about what the Creator did to man? To Adam, particularly. It says, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of what? Of life, and man became a living being. Who did that? Jesus. Jesus, of course, along with the Father and the Spirit of God, were actively involved in breathing into a into first human being the breath of life, and mankind became a man became a living being, a soul. It's not just a material, there is a spiritual aspect to man. He gave him life. This means that. That, he had, that man had the ability to be able to communicate. He had a mind and a will and emotions. He was, most importantly, able to imitate God in his character. God is holy and man can be holy. God is loving and man can be loving. God is merciful and man can be merciful. In him was life and that light was the light of men. Now this is going to become important in a few moments because we're going to find that they didn't receive the light. They didn't receive the life. But what is he talking about then when he says, okay, Jesus comes, he's already breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, now man becomes a living soul. Now Jesus comes, comes to, to Bethlehem, is born of a baby, he comes to give life. Well, are all the people that he's coming to dead? I mean, what? how does that work? They, they're living people, how... What's going on there? Well, we find in John chapter 20, for example, the entire book, reason the book of John is written, according to John chapter 20, verse 31, is this. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So what is this life that Jesus is talking about? There's an interesting story. Jesus, of course, as you know, was going around all kinds of places doing miracles, uh, those are very well known. He was one of the things he did was the feeding of the five thousand. You'll remember that he was he was uh, dis- in, in, uh, you know uh, feeding people and doing miracles, those kinds of things. And at one point, people began to follow him because he was feeding people. They they liked the fact that he was feeding people and they wanted more food, more those kinds of things. They were occupied with that. And at one point, Jesus says to the people that were following him in John chapter 6, verse 53, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. What was Jesus saying there? These are living people. These are people that are walking around. They're following Jesus. What is he saying that... And if you, don't, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you? Now, obviously, Jesus is trying to get their attention. And he is saying to them that you've got to receive me, or actually, you don't have any spiritual life in you. You are, as it stands, you are spiritually dead. See, we can be physically alive, and we are, and yet the Bible tells us actually that we are born spiritually dead. We're not born having a relationship with God, we're born separated from Him. In John chapter 6, verse 53, He says this Then, Mo, then Jesus said, Most assuredly I say unto you, uh, oh, I already, I already mentioned that, that unless you eat the flesh and son, the Son of Man and drink His blood, you will have no life in you. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you He made alive 
who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 5, even we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive with Christ. By, his, by grace you have been saved. Now something else about life that we need to understand, as John says, Jesus is the light of life, is that he is not just talking about um, quantitative life or life that extends forever. He is, it, is, it does extend forever, but he's talking about qualitative life as well. He says in John chapter 10, verse 10, for example, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That is the creator of the ends of the world who gave mankind life, who created everything and gave mankind life, comes back to earth now and he wants to energize people to give them spiritual life because people are spiritually dead. Why? Of course we know that it's because of our sin. Our sin makes us spiritually dead. The very the original sin of, of Adam and Eve. The Bible says, wherefore, as uh, the Bible says that uh, wherefore, wherefore as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and therefore death passed upon all men, because all have sinned. Finally, John he equates this life with knowing a person. In John 17, 3, it says this, and this is like eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life. Now, what's interesting is we've already established that man is dead spiritually. Everybody, mankind, people, human beings, are dead spiritually. They're born dead spiritually because of sin. And so we have this problem of darkness in the world that we discussed last Sunday. And we see here, notice what it says in verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness, catch this, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not grasp it. Now, let me pause and make this practical at this point. How many of you sometime this week are going to see non-Christians? You're going to see, interact with people that don't know the Lord. How many of you are going to, are going to be in that situation? Okay, many, many, maybe every, I don't know, many. Why won't they come to Christ? What is stopping them? What is stopping someone from truly coming to the saving knowledge of Christ? The Bible says here, that they do not grasp the light. The darkness does not grasp the light. See it there? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And we know from other texts that the Bible says that people are spiritually blind because of their sin, so that they can't recognize the light. They can't see it. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 19, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Their deeds were sinful. You, it's, it's as though you have this problem, this paradoxical problem, this the, the paradox of, of receiving the light here. It's kind of like you know when you first get out of college, and you, and you try to apply for a job, and they tell you, we're looking for somebody with experience, right? And you're like, how am I supposed to get that unless somebody hires me to do the job? I mean, you're sort of caught where you sort of say, okay, well, I need experience to be able to get this job, but everybody wants somebody with experience. You're, 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 it's, it's a Catch 22. And it's kind of that way when it comes to we're, we're in darkness and we can't see the light and we're blind because we can't see the light. And yet we need the light in order to be able to see the light. And it says here in this passage, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not 
that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. We're not going to get a great deal into, into John's ministry, but suffice it to say that he, he was sent in order to prepare people in, to, for the light. And I think there's a practical application that God wants us to be that kind of witness to others as well. But I want us to think about something here. It says here, he was in the world, the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own did not receive him. So we have here, uh, in, in, Second Cor- in fact, take your Bibles and turn there. I want you to see this, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 6 for just a moment. This is going to, this really, I think Paul is further giving explanation of the things that John has written in, in John 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says this, Therefore, since we have this ministry, we have received mercy. We do not lose heart, but we have, but we have uh, renounced the hidden things of shame, not, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. 2 Corinthians 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, catch that, the gospel, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age was blinded, has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus our Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of dark darkness, who has, catch this, shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now this is a reference to, remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai? and his face glowed with the glory of God. Remember that? It is saying that the glory of Jesus somehow, and we're going to learn how in a minute, shined in our hearts so that we can receive the light. There is this problem of the the manifestation of the truth condemning ourselves because of the darkness. The gospel is veiled to those who are perishing, but the light is received through the in the heart of, so that the glory of God, of, of God can be seen. Now, I'm going to ask this question at this point. What exactly does an unbeliever, a non-Christian, what does a non-Christian need to see? Okay, let me, let me put it this way. So, does a non-Christian need to understand the immutability of God in order to be saved? Some of, a few of you may not even know what that means. Okay. Do you need to? Does a non-Christian need to understand uh, the sovereignty of God? Nobody understands that actually. Um, um, we believe it, we accept it, but it's not un- completely understandable. Do, do you? Does, does a non-believer need to understand all of these things about who God is? No, it is the glory of the Christian to be able to delve into those things and chew on them and enjoy them and to know God more and more. But does a non-Christian have to know that? No. But he does, something's got to be, come into his heart to shine in his heart. What is that? We're going to learn in a few moments. Let's then pick up in verses 14 through 16 here of this passage. Now the passage tells us, verse 12, verse 13, we're going to be in 14, but it tells us, but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name who are born not of the of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God okay but how does someone receive what does they need what do they need to see the way of receiving the light verse 14 says this the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was of, him, of he whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me. 
for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace, for the, um, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus. Now, when it says here, the word became flesh, the word, and it says dwelt among us, that is tabernacled among us. There is a connection between the concept of a tabernacle in the Old Testament and here. The word became flesh, that's Jesus, and dwelt, tabernacled among us. The, the, the Jewish person would read that and they would make a connection that the, the presence of God that was in the tabernacle and the temple was now here, clothed in flesh. But... It does say, we beheld his glory. However, let's think about this for a minute. Did everyone behold the, the, the bright glory of God? Do you remember back in Exodus when Moses says, can I see your glory? And, G and God said to him, basically, my paraphrase, you can't see all of it or you'll be consumed. Do you remember that? So what we know to be true from other passages, like Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, is that, it says it here, but he made himself of no, well, I'll, I'll start here, let, it, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, did not think, consider it a thing to be grasped to be equal with God, because he is God, but made himself of no reputation, that is, the, literally, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. He emptied himself. What did he empty himself of? And the answer is, he emptied himself of his glory. We know that because actually in John chapter 17, verse 5, he's praying to his heavenly Father before he goes to the cross, and he says this, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world. There was something, there was a glory that was being limited. There was a glory that was being emptied while he was on earth. John 17, verse 24 says this, Father, I desire that they also may, uh, also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may also, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, what is I think another passage just sort of contrasts. You have this baby that's come in the manger and, and a man who is, or a person who's growing and all of this. But in Ezekiel chapter 26, verses 28 through 28, we have what I think is a description of Jesus in his glory. Listen to this. It says, And, of the, and above the firmament over the, their heads was likeness of a throne in appearance like sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness of the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And, and from the appearance of his waist and downward I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on, ra on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This is the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one speaking. Is that what people saw in Jesus? This brightness of the glory, the, the, the colors, and the appearance of fire all around? Is that what Jesus what people experienced when Jesus came to the earth. Answered, no, we know this, Isaiah 53. Who has believed our rapport, and to whom has the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as the root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus came to earth, he was born, and there was nothing about him rec that was recognizable as God. It's not like you'd see Jesus walking through the street, the street of Nazareth as a little kid. Oh, that he's like glowing or something. It was nothing like that. You couldn't tell he was God from that. It was the song got it right. Aren't you glad that the songs get it right sometimes? I know some of you face people on Facebook, I'm pointing out when the song gets The song got it right. Veiled in flesh. The Godhead, see, veiled the incarnate deity. 
got it right. So they say in the passage, we beheld his glory. John is speaking of him along with Peter and James. You remember that? On the Mount of Transfiguration, I won't take the time to look at this, but Matthew 17, 1 through 5 explains that. And the description is fairly similar to the description in Ezekiel. They did behold his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. But I want you to notice something here that I think is extremely important at this point. And that is, I want us to think about, about Moses back in the Old Testament. Remember, he was up on Mount Sinai, and, G- and God was there. And in Exodus chapter 33, verse 9, it says this, And it came to pass, when Moses entered the tabernacle, the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing in the tabernacle of the door, and all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent. So the Lord God spoke to Moses, face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And, and he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, the young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. So he's in the tabernacle speaking to God face to face. In, in that passage, later on, verse 14, it says, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to them, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Moses by this point, understood the the need for the presence of God in his life and in the life of those who, uh, in, in Israel's life as well. In fact, Moses then says in verse 18 of this passage, he says, and he said, please show me your glory. He said, I will make, and this is really key, he said, I will make my goodness. What part of the glory of God does does, uh, God show to Moses? I I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to to whom I will be gracious to. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And then later on, Exodus 20, 34, verse 4, it says this. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Now, look at our passage in John chapter 1. What does it say? We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full, full. What was Jesus full of? He wasn't full of all of his glory before everyone, but what was he full of? Grace and truth. Grace. Then later on, he says it again. Grace upon grace. Verse verse 16. And of his fullness, we have received all, we have all received what? Grace for grace. What, what, what fullness did we receive? What did people see? It was the grace of God. It was the fullness of the grace of God. What does a non-Christian need to be able to see in order to come to Christ? He needs to be able to see the grace of God. Now let's think a little bit about grace, God's grace. The Bible speaks of actually two different kinds of grace. Grace is unmerited favor or unmerited kindness. Think of the Old Testament word, loving kindness. Compassion, loving kindness that is undeserved and it's not merited. That's grace. And we desperately need the grace of God. Why? Because of our state of sin and spiritual death. 
But there are two kinds of grace. Would you take your Bibles, I want you to see this, and take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts for a moment, verse 14, or chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Some of the disciples are speaking to some men here, and we won't get into all the details of that, but let me just really hit on one thing. Acts chapter 14, and they're speaking of the Lord here, verse 17, chapter 14, verse 17. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness. What was the witness? In in that, he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. So they, they received, what was it? It was goodness, rain, harvest. That is called common grace. The Bible says that the rain falls on both the just and the unjust. Non-Christians receive the common grace of God. If you are in this room today, living in the United States, you have received a lot of God's common grace in your life, guaranteed. Right? We're all here. We're well fed. Most of us have houses. Most of us have cars. I mean, we have our recipients of the common grace of God, of the goodness of God. Both non-Christians and Christians are recipients of that kind of grace. But I want you to see something. Would you take your Bibles now and turn to Romans chapter 2? Romans chapter 2. Jesus, or, uh, Paul rather is speaking in Romans chapter 2 to people who are good people. Verses 4 and 5. Good in the sense of they're morally, they're moralists. They're morally ups, upright, upstanding kinds of people. They are probably well off. Notice what it says, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. That's the intention of God in his common grace, is that it would lead some to repentance. Verse 5, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Because of the hardness of the heart, that goodness can be ignored as a grace of God rather than accepted as a grace of God. And then, of course, that's the common grace of God. And there are some, and I've talked with some. I remember a few years ago leading somebody to Christ that, that, that in talking with them, they, they, understood, they understood that God had given them, God was good to them that they shouldn't have what they have and, and do what they do, been able to do what they do and all that. They, they got it. They understood that. They were not anti-God at all. They grasped that. And I said, I explained to them, I said, that's the goodness of God. That's the grace of God in your life that God desires to show you himself, hopefully to lead you to a place of repentance. And that person came to Christ. That's what the hope would be, the prayer that would be that, that that kind of goodness would draw somebody to a place of repentance. But folks, for those of us who know Christ as our Savior, isn't it true that what we really need to reflect on, what we have all seen, is the grace of God? You want to see the glory of God today, Christian. Do you want to see the glory of God today in your life? If you know Christ as your Savior, you have received salvific grace, efficacious grace. You have received the kind of grace in Ephesians chapter 2, where it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You've received that kind of grace. But you know, very oftentimes we forget 
about the grace of God. It's like, it, it's like we, get, we start thinking that we deserve something or that we've earned what we get, whether it's of God's common grace or his salvific grace. We're somehow better than somebody else in some way. If you, if, I, I just tell you by way of illustration this. I was down actually in Pensacola taking, a, taking uh, Caitlin down there and in, in a particular uh, sort of service that we were in, somebody sang a song called Were It Not For Grace. Here's what they said. Time measured out my days. Life carried me along. In my soul I yearned to follow God, but knew I'd never be so strong. I looked hard at this world to learn how heaven could be gained, just to end where I began, where human effort is all in vain. Were it not for grace, I could tell you where I'd be, wandering down some pointless road to nowhere, with my salvation up to me. I know how that would go, the battles I would face forever running but losing the grace, losing the race, were it not for grace. See, that's the glory of God that we can experience now. I got to tell you, when I listened to that those song and I started reflecting, I think it was because I was down in Pensacola and I was thinking about my being a college student and then where I am now and all of that and thinking about how undeserving I am. I cried. I was tearing up. My, my daughter asked me later, why were you crying? Because I realize I deserve nothing. There's just some times where the Spirit of God works in our lives to cause us to realize that we deserve nothing. And that what we have is solely and completely by the grace of God. And when, when, that, when we realize that, that is when we really experience the, the glory of God, the identity of who God is. And we get, and really, I think that that is part of how the assurance of knowing that we are Christians is when we begin to just realize, I don't deserve anything I have. I don't deserve the salvation I've been given. I don't deserve the relations I have. I don't deserve the family I was, brought, I was raised in. I don't deserve any of this. It is the grace of God in our lives. Why did Jesus come to earth? What is the essence of why Jesus came to earth? He came so that people could receive the fullness of grace and truth. The fullness of it in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ came and he died. He took our sin on himself. He died to pay the punishment of our sin so that we could have our sins forgiven. I'd like, to take, I'd like you to take your Bibles and try to go to one more passage here. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 15 through 21. And I want, you to, I want you to see this morning that in this passage, it, it says in verse 19 that we, that we can be filled with all of the fullness of God. This is talking to, uh, about a Christian. Filled with all of the fullness of God. Does that mean that we can you know, somehow experience what we saw in Ezekiel and the Mount of Transfiguration, all of that? No. But there is, how, do we, how are we filled with all of the fullness of God? Look at the passage, verse three, chapter 3, verse 15. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his what? What does it say there? The riches, the riches of his glory. And what will happen? To be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in what? In love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is that the width and length, and depth, and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. When's the last time, brother, sister, in Christ, when's the last time you were just overwhelmed with the grace of God and the love of God that it just blew your mind? 
You couldn't understand it. Can you really understand the love of God? Why would he love me or love you? There's no, it doesn't make sense. And yet he does. And we know it. That's why Christ came down to earth. The fullness of the glory of God, grace and truth so that we can depend on, our, on him and not ourselves. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. So there are three questions we need to ask. Number one, do you recognize the grace of God in your life? There are only two kinds of people ultimately here this morning. There are people who, who aren't, don't know Christ, and there are people that do. If you don't know Christ, if you don't know for sure where you will spend eternity, what you need to recognize is the grace of God. His kindness in sending his son to pay the punishment for your sin so that you could have your sins forgiven so that you could have a relationship with God. And if you know Christ as your Savior, you've experienced the grace of God. But, but have you recognized it in a while? Number two, will you understand your own undeservedness and sinfulness and trust in Christ? That's actually the key to the whole thing. Why is it? that people don't come to Christ because they don't recognize the grace of God. Why is it that they don't recognize the grace of God? Because they're unwilling to understand their own undeservedness and their own sinfulness. Because when we realize that we are undeserving and sinful, when we realize that, then we, we will immediately know the grace of God. Christian, if you haven't been impressed with the grace of God in, in a while, maybe we need to reflect on how undeserving we are. We get this mindset somehow in our lives. Our culture tells us, you deserve that, you deserve that. You de we deserve nothing. We deserve hell, actually, is what we deserve. All of us. When we realize that, we begin to see all the abundance Abundant, the grace for grace, the grace upon grace, the grace that Ephesians says is lavished on us. And we experience the fullness of God. Christ was born physically so that you could be born spiritually. Have you experienced the new birth? If you're listening this morning and you haven't experienced this new birth. The Bible says, John 1.12, right here in the passage, but, if you, but, if you, uh, but as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You need to receive Christ. And if you're not sure whether you've done that before or not, please come and talk with me after the, after the service. I'll be glad to take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you have received this grace. You have applied it to your own heart and life so that you can truly become a child of God. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning and we praise you for your grace. We thank you that when Christ came, he came not in the fullness of his grandeur, but he did come in the fullness of his grace. And he died so that we could receive that unmerited, undeserved kindness and have eternal life, spiritual life. Lord, may we remember through this season that is the essence of why Christ came. And Lord, may we also be prayerful and mindful of those that we will come into contact with that don't know Christ. Give us opportunities. I think even tonight, of the fact that there might be some that, that, that will be here that don't know Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would work in, in that service tonight 
that the gospel would be clear, that your spirit will work through your word to bring people to a saving knowledge of Christ. And Lord, if there is anybody here this morning, I pray, that do, does not know you, I pray that you would work in their hearts to under, help them to understand their need to see the grace of God. Work in their hearts as only you can do. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Hello, my name is Jim Ganam, Senior Pastor of Bethel Baptist Church. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for streaming our service. We hope and pray that it was truly a blessing to you. You know, we live in a day where we have access to the preaching of God's Word with just a phone or a tablet or with a couple of clicks on our computer. But we really would love to meet you in person. You know, there is just nothing that really replaces the experience of being in a loving community. Here at BBC, you'll be greeted by people who genuinely want to help you to have the best experience you can possibly have. If you have a family, we can help your kids find their fun, interactive classes, and your littlest ones can get settled into our safe, fun, and well-equipped nursery. Then help yourself to a cup of coffee and join us for the main service for singing, praying, and the preaching of God's Word. Although we'd love to have you visit our church, this is not our greatest concern for you. Our greatest concern is that you know how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to let you know about a resource that will help you with this. It is called The Exchange. The Exchange is an easy to use four week guide that helps people to learn how they can have a relationship with God according to the Bible. If you contact us, we'd love to give you a copy while supplies last and we'd also love to meet with you either in person or over the phone or over a FaceTime or Zoom video call so we can walk you through this helpful resource. If you're interested in going through the Exchange Bible Study with us, or if you just have a need we can pray for, please email us. May the Lord richly bless you. We hope to see you soon. Hello, my name is Jim Ganam, Senior Pastor of Bethel Baptist Church. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for streaming our service. We hope and pray that it was truly a blessing to you. You know, we live in a day where we have access to the preaching of God's Word with just a phone or a tablet or with a couple of clicks on our computer. But we really would love to meet you in person. You know, there is just nothing that really replaces the experience of being in a loving community. Here at BBC, You'll be greeted by people who genuinely want to help you to have the best experience you can possibly have. If you have a family, we can help your kids find their fun, interactive classes, and your littlest ones can get settled into our safe, fun, and well-equipped nursery. Then help yourself to a cup of coffee and join us for the main service for singing, praying, and the preaching of God's Word. Although we'd love to have you visit our church, this is not our greatest concern for you. Our greatest concern is that you know how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to let you know about a resource that will help you with this. It is called The Exchange. 
The Exchange is an easy-to-use, four-week guide that helps people to learn how they can have a relationship with God according to the Bible. If you contact us, we'd love to give you a copy while supplies last, and we'd also love to meet with you either in person or over the phone or over a FaceTime or Zoom video call so we can walk you through this helpful resource. If you're interested in going through the Exchange Bible Study with us, or if you just have a need we can pray for, please email us. May the Lord richly bless you. We hope to see you soon.